So we're continuing in a series uh, that we started a few weeks ago entitled The Jesus I Never Knew. The Jesus I Never Knew. And we're looking at the account of a man named John Mark who wrote the book of Mark. And this book is written in a very succinct and, and kind of a plain way. This is kind of, if you will, the highlight reel of Jesus' life here on earth. And he's writing to a group of people that are experiencing a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, a lot of difficulty. These people are living under the Roman Empire and they're experiencing oppression. They're experiencing persecution and challenge. And in those situations, when you're under the gun like that, right, uh, you don't need long, flowery uh, soliloquies, okay? Uh, the words of Luke, the physician, are great. Uh, Matthew, as a tax collector, is awesome. But, but can somebody please just give it to me succinct, nice, and sweet, and just lay it out? Here's Jesus. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking at this book and rediscovering, and for some maybe, discovering for the very first time who Jesus is. He is our servant savior. And as we read it, we want to look through that lens of what it does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to be like Jesus? What does it mean to be an apprentice, a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to love like Jesus? And this is important because we can uh, uh, easily, and it happens to a lot of us, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, as we approach the Bible, as we approach the life of uh, Jesus, we can choose the verses that we like about Jesus, the ones uh, that we care for, and, and just kind of discard the ones that we don't. So, so we choose the verses we're more comfortable. I like this Jesus. I don't necessarily like that Jesus, right? Uh, uh, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. I like that Christ Jesus. So I'm going to go run marathons and I'm going to go take tests and not study and get A's, right? <laughs> that was me in college, okay? We, we like that Jesus. And, and so what we do is we send to sort of grab uh, these verses we like. And as we do, we try to assemble a Jesus that conveniently fits our lifestyle, Matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States, he did this very thing. There's a Thomas Jefferson Bible is what it's called. And what he did is he went through the Bible and he kind of just cut out the parts that he didn't like. And he just kept the ones uh, that he did. And he made his own uh, a Bible. And so what we do, depending on whatever your, your lifestyle happens to be or whatever you may be feeling in that season of life, we conveniently conform Jesus to us. He, he becomes, you know, the, the conservative Jesus, or, or he becomes, you know, the more liberal Jesus. He becomes the more pacifist Jesus. He becomes the, the, the supernatural Jesus. He becomes, you know, the teacher Jesus, and, and, and on and on and on we go. He, he just sort of affirms our preferences, helps our desires. He doesn't really challenge us uh, as a human being, because at the end of the day, he starts to sort of just look like us. Right? And what happens is we construct a Jesus that fits into our box, and the Jesus that fits into our box, that Jesus can't transform us because he can't challenge us. And yet today, I feel like more than ever in history, we don't need a make-believe Jesus. We don't need a Jesus that looks like us. We need a real living Jesus, a Jesus that challenges us, a Jesus that was willing to transform us, a Jesus that can step into our lives, say some hard truths, and change us. Come on, say a good amen right there, right? Yeah, that's, that's what we desperately need. And what's interesting to me is that the impulse to put Jesus in a box is not something new, or it's not a modern phenomenon. On. And as we arrive today at Mark chapter 2, we see that Jesus' ministry is beginning to blow up, uh, particularly after he heals a leper. Uh, if you want your ministry to blow up, heal a leper. <laughs> it'll, it'll take a wind, right? So Jesus' ministry begins to blow up, and, and what, we'll, what, you, what you'll notice, and what we'll notice in today's uh, reading, is that people stri start to try to figure out, okay, who is this Jesus? What do I do with him? Where can I put him? What, what box can I put him in? And these crowds come to Jesus, and, and a lot of people come, and okay, he's, he's the healer guy, right? That's what he does. He comes, and, and he, uh, he, he presents himself to my problem, and he solves it, and so that's who he is. There's no challenge to my life. There's no really push against me to change. He just comes to solve my problem problem. So, so they come to him because they want the healing helper, Jesus. And then um, you're going to see that Jesus, what he does is he resists that box. He doesn't jump into that box. Now he's pro-healing, but he also has a message. Uh, in fact, we learned last week that he always starts with a message, and it's a very challenging message at 
uh, that. And, and then they we're going to see that as he gets popular, the religious leaders begin to come. And, and, and as they come, they want to make sure that Jesus is conforming to their legal standards of what a religious leader should do. And so we're going to watch Jesus define himself in opposition to them as well, because Jesus doesn't fit in that box either. And so it's fascinating that this impulse that we often feel to that today was felt back then as well. People want to put Jesus in a convenient box, but what we're going to see today and throughout the next couple of, uh, of weeks is Jesus inconveniently steps out of all of our boxes. So let's read the text, and what we're going to do is instead of just reading the whole thing and then unpacking it, we're just going to read and unpack as we go. We're going to pick it up where we left off, Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 40. Follow along on the screen. It says this, a man with leprosy came to him and begged on his knees. Watch this, what he says. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, leprosy was kind of this broad brush kind of term to talk, a variety, to talk about a variety of skin diseases. They were uh, the diseases that they didn't have a cure for. They were very, very painful, and they were often very, had very tragic endings. In fact, if you had leprosy, uh, you had to stay 10 feet away from somebody else because it was very contagious. If the wind was blowing, you had to stay about 100 feet away from people, and you would have to yell, unclean, 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 so people could identify you. You would wear specific clothes as another way of identifying uh, that you were in that posture. So if you have it, you would also be quarantined from society. And because there were no cure for it, you were quarantined indefinitely. And so if you had leprosy, not only was there physical pain involved, but maybe even greater than that is the social and emotional pain of being isolated, ostracized. I mean, we could call kind of relate to that, uh, hello COVID, right? What, what that kind of meant, uh, and, and we can sort of relate. But that's who this man was. He was isolated and he was unclean. Now what's fascinating is as he uh, initiates this conversation with Jesus and he acknowledges, if you are willing, just that very question alone, Alone, it, it includes some uncertainty. I know that you're able, Jesus, yet I'm uncertain that you're willing to be near somebody like me. And I love Jesus' statement as he continues. He says, Jesus is filled with compassion, reaches out his hand, and touches the man, saying, I am willing, he said, be clean. Now, I love that. Sometimes we do things with the wrong attitude, right? Or with the wrong motives. Sometimes we do things begrudgingly. But Jesus leaves no doubt. He says, hey, I have compassion. Oh, and I'm willing. I want you to be clean. Be clean. Now, what's shocking, if somehow you came in contact with someone who had this disease, you yourself became unclean. But Jesus here, he kind of flips it. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You don't make me unclean. I touch you and you become clean. Verse 42, immediately, you'll see that a lot in the gospel of Mark, that word immediately, uh, there's just a quick pace to the gospel here. The leprosy left him and he was cleaned. And then he tells them to fulfill the law. So Jesus sent him away, verse 43, at once with this strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing. All throughout the book of Leviticus, you could read about infections skin diseases. And if you're doing a one-year Bible reading plan, th these are verses that really get you bogged down, right? Uh, praise God for a psalm in one of those days, right? Like go over and get, get some of that because these can get bogged down. Now, interesting to me, interesting thing to me, Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. So the priest had no power to heal, but according to the law in the Old Testament, they were the people who could identify that somebody had been cleansed. So if you had this disease and somehow it left you, they would help identify you and, and bring you back into the community uh, 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 and the social isolation would end. So the leaders could identify that God was working, but they didn't have the power to release it. So Jesus tells him, hey, don't tell anybody. Look at what happens next in verse 45. Instead, 
Of course he did, right? This man went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And, and so it kind of begs the question, well, why would Jesus tell him, hey, don't tell anybody? Well, the text summarizes what happens next. I mean, Jesus couldn't, couldn't even enter towns. He couldn't go anywhere. He would have to go alone into the wilderness because people were just coming to him. And Jesus healed Je- the, the crowds. That's what we want, this, this Jesus. So Jesus suddenly gets, gets really famous, and people from all over are coming to him to be healed. Now, at the same time, the religious leaders notice, uh, hey, there's somebody releasing this kind of power. We need to know who this somebody is. And, and so uh, the healing of this leper kickstarts the evaluation of Jesus's ministry, if you will. And now we arrive at Mark chapter 2, where we're going to spend uh, the rest of our time together. And I want to highlight three reactions from the text that we experience. Three reactions that many of us can kind of fall into one of these three categories from time to time. We're going to see the reaction of the friends of this paralytic man. Uh, they have a very similar attitude like Jesus had towards the leper. Yes, I am willing to help you. I'm to bring you to Jesus. Then we're going to see the reaction of Jesus towards this paralytic. And then the third thing is we're going to see the reaction of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So here we go, Mark chapter 2. This is what it says. A few days later, watch this, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. So Jesus, he was raised in Nazareth, It's where he grew up, but at some point in his life, he moved over to Capernaum, and that was where kind of uh, his home base for ministry was, and he enters this home. Now, that wasn't his home. Most scholars believe that that was the home of Simon Peter, uh, Jesus' disciple. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside of the door. So imagine the house is full, the courtyard, that those uh, homes often used to have courtyards, those things are full. In fact, the Luke account of the same story tells us the Pharisees and the teachers showed up as well. And they sat in the middle of the room and they came from every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And, and these Pharisees, they were uh, a very strict from a very strict religious sect, uh, they would uh, they, they called themselves students of Ezra the priest, if you remember Ezra from our Nehemiah series. Uh, so they had appointed themselves as the right interpreters of the law of God. So they show up and make sure, okay, this guy claims to have power. Let's make sure he's conforming to the right religious rules. Let's make sure he's doing it the right way. And so they're coming to evaluate Jesus. Now, Jesus is used to crowds. Okay, Jesus is used to healing, but now you get these people who are in there and evaluating his ministry. He's a healer. He's a restorer. But Jesus wants to present himself as more than just that. Watch what he does next. The text tells us that Jesus began to preach the word to them. So imagine These people hear all the miracles that Jesus is. He's healing lepers. He's opening blind eyes. He's casting out demons. They show up and they want to be touched by him, right? The religious leaders are there to see, you know, if he's doing it properly. And Jesus begins to preach? Really? Like, like I'm guessing that they were slightly disappointed. Like, put yourself in their position. We're here for the supernatural Jesus. And you're preaching, like the way I, I think about ma- the, the uh, Gospel of Mark mentions crowds a lot. But when you think about crowds, uh, if you guys ever seen that uh, Michael Jackson meme where he's just sitting there and eating popcorn and it's just like, we're just here for the meme. We're just here for the comments, right? Like that's these guys. They're just here for the supernatural. Like just entertain us, Jesus. That's what we're here for. We're not here for the repentance. We're not here to hear your message. We're here to be healed. And Jesus knew what the real need of the people was. It's to hear about the kingdom. It's to hear about what he's coming to bring. And so the ministry of Jesus always centered around teaching and preaching of the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? The word of God. Uh, I love this. Charles Spurgeon once said that Jesus or uh, God only had one son and he made him a preacher. <laughs> I kind of like that. In the meantime... Verse 3 tells us some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. So this was the original March matness, and these are the final four. (laughs) 
Okay, just making sure you're awake. Just, listen, if you're new this morning, it doesn't get any better, so just bear with me. All right, we got dad jokes for days, right? <laughs> Verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? The, the, the people, the friend's faith. Now, now, this is amazing to me because most people think of faith in many different ways. Some equate it to a, a belief system. Some equate it to a sort of values or a set of systems that, and attitudes that they, they use for life. Others think it's just some comforting thoughts or, you know, faith is just more like a, a crutch for the weak. But Mark tells us that Jesus actually sees their faith. You see, the, the, that, that word faith is mentioned five times in the gospel of, of Mark, and none of them represent just this attitude attitude or this feeling or set of values. It always represents actions. Faith to Mark is something that you can see. Our faith is something that moves us to action. It's something that is displayed. In fact, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, James, he says in his book that faith without action, faith without works is actually useless. It's, it's, it's dead. It has no value. And for these guys, it's actually something that you can see in response to something that you can see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it is something that you can see in response to a hope that you can't see. And these men had a hope. They had this faith that, that, that moved them to action. And it was this, if I could just get this friend of mine to Jesus, Jesus would intervene. Now, before we see what Jesus does, I want to point out just a couple of observations about the reaction of these friends. Okay, what were their reactions to the story? And let me just tell you right up front, uh, uh, kind of a, a spoiler alert, your circle of friends matters, okay? Young people, uh, your homies, your cronies, your crew, the people, that you're, your boys, who you hang out with, has a tremendous impact on you. I know that today, friendships and, and community are defined by the number of Facebook friends you have or the number of YouTube followers you, that you have. Uh, my son was telling me once, uh, Dad, I follow this guy on, on, on YouTube. He, he's so cool. He's my friend. I thought that was, that was interesting, but I think today many people have that same uh, attitude. But listen, we need some real friends, right? Because true friends are not the ones that make your problems go away. True friends are the ones that stick around when your problems show up. That's a true friend. Now, I want you to really enter the emotion of this story. We don't know the names of these men. We don't know the name of the paralytic. We just know that this man was confined to his mat. Now, uh, most of the people in that day would sleep on a mat, and then they would roll it up and be on their way. But this guy lived on this mat. This was his life. And in the first century, someone who was paralyzed was typically believed to, to be cursed. He was either the result of an accident, or, or maybe they were born that way, but some where along the line, whether it's in their parents' lineage or whether the, the poor choices of the individual, uh, some, the sin caused this to happen, caused this action to happen. In fact, scholars, theologians, and church historians tell us that this man was paralyzed as a direct result of his action. He did something that led to this behavior. It was some immoral lifestyle. Some say uh, uh, it was maybe uh, the result of STD. Some say that he had actually some epilepsy on top of that. So, so there's a lot going on with this guy. He's in a lot of pain. He's crippled. He's living in a non-ADA compliant world. I mean, imagine that, right? We, we think, man, there's no more parking spot except that one that has the cool like wheelchair thing. Nobody will see if I park here. Okay, never mind. I'm just going in confession mode this morning. <sighs> Lord, forgive me as I got my coffee this morning. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, someone in this condition, why am I sweating? You're sweating, not me, right? Someone in this condition was not someone you befriended, okay? Now, this man could not only leave his mat, he couldn't feed himself. He couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. There was no way uh, for him to provide for himself. He just laid there on the mat, hoping for the charity of others. Now, I can only imagine him maybe dreaming of days before where he was walking and running and, and moving and thinking, wow, I can do these great things again. But every morning he would wake up from that dream and I'm confined to this mat. Doesn't that sound awful? I mean, that sounds terrifying, sounds crushing, but, but he's got one thing going for him. Apparently, he's got some, some friends, and he's got some real friends, not just acquaintances, but like true thick and thin friends, the kind of friends I would suggest we all need as well. 
And I love uh, their reaction because this is where we see the power of friendship. This is where we see the power of true godly community, God's design for community. I read a, a quote this past week from uh, Pastor Andy Stanley, and he said this, your friends determine the quality and the direction of your life. The quality of the direction of your life are determined by your friends. The Bible says it this way, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Look at Proverbs. It says, the righteous choose their friends very carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. My dad used to always say, hey, show me who your friends are and I'll show you what your future is going to be. It's, it's so true. We were never designed to do life alone. It was always designed to be in a thriving, intimate community. You know the first time in the Bible that it's, it ever mentions that something was not good? It's actually in the book of Genesis. So you have the creation account in Genesis 1. God creates the stars, the moon, the heaven, all these things, and it says, this is good, this is good, this is good. Then he creates us, humankind, and God said, this is very good. And then God sees man all alone, and he says, we got a problem here. This is not good. Man shouldn't be alone, right? It was never intended for us to be uh, alone. We were created for intimate community, especially when it comes to doing uh, church life and, and the, the, the body of Christ. Uh, this is how John Wesley put it. I love this. He says, you must find companions or make them. The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. So that's not to say there's no place for our private, quiet time or our one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. That's massively significant. But throughout the pages of Scripture, there is no uh, picture that we're given that we're meant to do this thing in isolation as a silo. You know, just me and my buddy Jesus, right? No, no, we're meant for community. Now, please hear me when I say this. Many people think that Sunday morning church attendance is their community. And to some degree, it is, but Sunday morning service is not necessarily the church. This is a gathering of a crowd. Now, I want you to attend, and it's important that you're here, but they, this may not always be the most intimate community that we have. Why? Because I can show up, and I can look the part, I can dress the part, I can act the part, I can have my big Bible here, I can have a big smile on my face and say, God is good. I mean, you wouldn't even know anything that's going on about me. Nobody knows who you are and you can leave and everything may be a wreck in your life, but you presented so well. The only time that maybe somebody gets to, to see you is, is the pastor who's chasing you down by the doorway and then says something extremely awkward to you, right? By the way, if that's happened to you, like, thank you for coming back. We're so glad that you're here. Listen, it's all in good intention, okay? I tell my wife all the time, oh, I met this new couple today, and I said this. And she's like, what did you just say to them? And I said, oh, I thought it was cute. They're like, no, you're crazy, okay? Uh, see, Sunday mornings may not be the best expression of community, okay? So let me say it this way. Life-giving, life-changing, true communities, listen, happens in circles, not rows. It happens in circles, not rows. Now, rows are fantastic. We, we celebrate rows, but circles take it to the next level. So think about this. This is the way we, we use this in our vocabulary, in our language. These are the circles I run in, right? This, this is my sphere of influence. I've never heard of a row of influence, <laughs> okay? Now, now, guys, let me give you a, a, a life hack, okay? If you're single and, and you like a girl, okay, and she promotes you to the circle of friends, she, run, she's not into you, okay, that, okay, that was for free, never mind, but I think about some of the most uh, <laughs> meaningful conversations in my life, they're always around circles, sitting around the dining room table, having intimate conversation with my family, talking about the stressful things of life, sharing struggles, sharing real life. I think about campfires, when we sit around the campfire at church camp, right? And you're talking to people who are making life-altering decisions, not for just that moment, but for the rest of their life. Uh, I love here at Journey, we have a a CrossFit Bible study class uh, that we do. And, and it, there's something about working out with guys, especially that are uh, better than you and, and more athletic than you. And then you find out that they're older than you. That's really humbling, okay? I'm just, just gonna throw that out there. But every time after we uh, have our class, guess what we do? We sit in a circle and we talk. 
and we have real intimate conversation and real meaningful conversation. And some of the best conversations I've had in the last couple of years have happened in that group where we could just be vulnerable to each other. Whoop, shout out to my CrossFit boys. You guys know who you are, okay? So this paralytic had a circle of friends that deeply care for him. Now, let me show you three quick ways how they exemplified true community. If you're taking notes, jot these down. This is the first one. In true community, watch this, we carry each other's mat. We carry each other's mat. These men carried the mat of their friends. Now, every one of us, listen, has a mat. This mat, this man's mat represents the thing that he most struggles with. It's a reminder of his brokenness. For you, it may be different. For you, it may be an overwhelming fear. Maybe it's a relational problem. Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's an addiction. We all have a mat. Uh, Galatians 6.2 tells us, carry each other's mats. Carry each other's burdens, and in this you will fulfill the law of Christ. In that context, the law of Christ was considered the law of love, which goes back to Jesus' greatest two laws, saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So you're loving your neighbor as yourself when you carry their mat. And here's what I've often found to be true. Often it's our brokenness that pushes people away doesn't it? That the, the, the keeps people at a distance. We're afraid to let people too close. After all, if these people really knew who I was, or, or they, if they really know what I've done, will they actually be around me? Will they actually still hang out with me? Will they actually still care? What if they find out who I voted for? Right? Too soon? Too, okay, too soon. Uh, okay. Uh, but the, the, the reality is we're all weird and different, Right? And I found that whenever I take my mask off and become real and honest, the reaction is never, ugh, look at that. The reaction is, oh, you too? You struggle with that too? Wow, I thought I was the only one. See, we all carry mats. Listen, we're all in this hospital together. Some of us just got here sooner than others. So you got to ask yourself this question. Am I available for the kind of friendship that lets another person close enough to see the tough stuff in my life? Do we actually let people close enough to see our vulnerabilities, to see our brokenness, to see the difficult, messy parts of our lives? Second question we need to ask is, is, is what or, or whose mat are you carrying? For this uh, paralyzed man, his friends could have thought, man, if we get too close to him, we might contract what he has. And some of us do that same thing. Some churches uh, do that same thing. Well, pastor, if we allow them into this building, they're going to taint us. They're, they're going to poison our kids. They are messy. In other words, if we expose ourselves to that, we may catch it too. See, sometimes it's not about keeping our messiness at bay. It's that we see somebody else's messiness and we say, I don't want to get involved with that. that. That's too much. This will potentially tarnish me. Listen, somebody else's miracle might be on the other side of your willingness to pick up their mat. In fact, think about this. A lot of us are here today because somebody picked up your mat, because somebody picked up my mat, because somebody picked up a corner of, of my mat. I'm here today because my parents loved me enough along the way to tell me the hard truths in life. They picked up a corner of my mat. Uh, I had a mentor who was, who was there for me, who I didn't cherish, who I didn't value, but he kept encouraging me. He kept coming after me. He kept fighting for me, and he kept encouraging me. He picked up a corner of my mat. I'm here today because my wife, she loves me, and she's willing to bear with me and put up with me, and she sees all my scars and all my wounds, and she's carrying my mat. She's still there for me. We we are all here because somebody picked up a corner of our mat. So what does it look like if we were to start picking up somebody else's mat? Jesus said to the leper, I am willing to help you be clean. Are we willing to help others? Here's the second thing true community does. In true community, we do the hard work. We do the hard work. Now think about this. They carried him through the streets. And I imagine it wasn't like two houses over. They pick up this man on this mat and they take him down the streets through the crowds. It's probably hot, sweaty, muggy. They're carrying their buddy. Uh, we're almost there, friend. We're almost there. We're going to get you to, to the place, right? And, and they get to this place and there's no more room. The house is full. The courtyard is full. They could have easily said, well, I guess Jesus doesn't want to heal you today. We're going to leave. 
You know, they could have given up and gone home. Or they could have said, you know, we're going to plant you right out here. And hopefully when Jesus comes by, he sees you and he touches you and, and your, your paths cross. No, no. What do they do? They, they get creative. They get resourceful. They get inventive. Sometimes real community, real friendship requires persistence. Sometimes it requires sacrifice. Sometimes it takes creativity. True community puts in the work. When you care about somebody, you will go the extra mile for them. And I can imagine the, the engineer in the group, the engineer out of these four buddies saying, well, well, I got a crazy idea. What if we go up through the roof? <laughs> you see, sometimes to get to Jesus, we got to get up. We got to go up. Now, first century houses in that region were usually small, uh, single room dwelling places with flat rooftops. So this was probably a flat rooftop, and, and those flat rooftops were often used as porches, as, as balconies. They were made up of twigs, mud, and, and, and other things like that. And so they often had a ladder that you would climb up, you would go on top. People would sometimes air out their laundry up there. People would go up there on their rooftops to meditate, think, ponder, pray. So these men have an opportunity. They go up to the top, and they start digging. They had to do the hard work. The Bible says they had to dig through the roof. It's not like every time you see a cartoon of this thing, it's like, oh, one scoop and boom, the whole roof is off. Yay, there's Jesus. No, these guys had to dig through the thing. They had to make a hole big enough to lower a paralytic man on his mat to Jesus. Like, now, now just, just imagine that for a moment. Imagine briefly if that were to happen here <laughs> right now. Like wherever you're watching for, imagine that, uh, that we're listening all together and all of a sudden there's a sound on the top of the roof, right? Some rumbling uh, uh, above us. You know, at times like the projector here, it starts to shake and you probably noticed it's shaking. We figured out what that is. It's not going to fall on anybody. Don't worry, okay? It just shakes because when the train, a big payload of train flies by, it like rattles the whole thing. So it actually rattles our building and just begins to shake here. But, but imagine like somebody's up there with a jackhammer, right? Like, and it's right in your area, right? And you're just sitting there enjoying your coffee and stuff is falling in your coffee. Like, whoa, that's, that's, that's rude, right? Some of us hate interruptions. I hate loud chewers in the movie theater, okay? And, and this guy's breaking through our roof, right? Like, just, just imagine. <laughs> he's, there, he's there digging a hole. Now, imagine Peter, right? He's there. This is his house. And he's probably like, I know you're in good hands with Allstate, but my goodness, I hope my insurance company covers this roof, like, what are these guys thinking? If it happened today, all the young people would be out with their phones, like filming, like, <laughs> this is going on our YouTube channel, hashtag church fails. This is going to be epic. A million views, here we come, right? See, listen, sometimes we think the best friendships are the easiest one, but that's not always the case. Now, sometimes it is. Sometimes we get friends and they're like a glove and then we have affinity and it's like, man, we were created for each other. Like we just love each other and it feels so natural. But if you look over your shoulder, maybe the last 10, 15, 20 years of our lives, aren't some of the best relationships the ones that require some real work that, to get through some hard things, to, to really work through some difficulty or disagreement or, or, or difficult season or trial or struggle? See, we buy into the lie that things are always best when they're easy. And often it's the opposite. Meaningful relationships, friendships require sacrifice. It's hard work. It's not just check the box. No, I'm here and I'm willing to do the hard work for you. Uh, there's a program called Intercept, and this program helps men that struggle with addiction. And I love their tagline that they use for the program. It's called, we do hard work. Why? Because relationships matter. Right? The relation, the friendship matters. Here's the third thing that they do. In true community, we point others to Jesus. We just bring others to Jesus. This is always the goal. I think one of the best ways to love like Jesus is through genuine friendship that points people right back to Jesus. That's it. Look, I've been in situations where people have asked me very difficult questions, theological ones that I couldn't answer, uh, uh, life, like big questions of life. And I tell them, look, I may not have all the answers. I may not have all the theology correct. We may not have all those right solutions, but I know the person who does, his name is Jesus. Listen, your faith 
can move the heart of God and impact a person's eternal destiny. All you do is point them to Jesus. Jesus looked at their faith and he was moved to action. More than ever today, we need a church. We need people. And we want to be the church where we help people find and follow Jesus. We're pointing people to Jesus. We want to be the people who are moving to action on behalf of others. We're not pointing them to a cool church. We're not pointing them to a goofy pastor. We're not... Thankfully, we're not pointing them to like a cool ministry, right? We're pointing them to Jesus. These guys could have easily said, no, it's too hard. No, it's too much work. It's going to be embarrassing. I mean, think about it. Jesus is giving a TED Talk. You're going to be lowered right in front of him with all like the religious Jewish people sitting right there judging you. Like that's really the game plan here through the roof. What if, what if the, you know, as we're doing the roof, Jesus doesn't do anything. He's upset. You just ruined his buddy's roof, right? This could go sideways in a million and one ways. But they were convinced, if I can just bring my friend before Jesus, I don't have all the right relationships or the right resources or the right suggestions, but I'm going to do everything in my power to bring them before Jesus. I love their persistence here. I love how determined they are. You know, sometimes this, this really convicted me this week as sometimes I deal with certain situations and cases and I think, man, it's over. It's done. There's no coming back from this. And guess what? Humanly speaking, that's true. But then I, I, I was reading this and I was like, man, if I could just get these people in front of Jesus, Jesus can intervene. Jesus can do something. Listen, I want to encourage you today. If you have a friend, if you have somebody who's walked away from Jesus, if you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, or, or, if, you or if you're in, in, a, in a situation where, where people that are meaningful to you have walked away, don't stop bringing them before Jesus. Don't stop praying for them. Don't stop encouraging them. Don't stop pointing them, hey, come to the one that can heal you. Hey, come to the one that can save you. His name is Jesus. So now these guys go through all this work and they get this guy to Jesus and let's watch the reaction of Jesus. Here's what happens next. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, sons, uh, son, sons, son, your sins are forgiven. Yeah, that's probably their reaction too. Just like, what? What just happened, Right? I imagine the crowds and the friends were like disappointed. Really, Jesus? We went through all of that? Like we did all of that. And, and, and that's what you're going to say? But what Jesus is doing here is fascinating because everyone in the room knew exactly what they were anticipating. This man clearly was paralyzed. Jesus does the one thing that we, ex Jesus, uh, do the one thing that we expect you to do, and Jesus often doesn't. He actually turns it up on its head. Obviously, they want this man to be par who's paralyzed and their friend to be healed. Now, listen, Jesus is pro-healing. He's going to heal him, but Jesus grabs this moment as the religious leaders are eyeing him like a hawk, and he looks at this guy, and he offers him the thing that he was not asking for. That's not really why we're here, Jesus. I know that. We'll get to that. But here, Jesus wants to prove to them something. He's not just a healer. He's trying to make a point. That's, I'm more than the person who can solve your presenting problems. And some of us are here, and we've come to church with some presenting problems, right? We've got anxiety. We've got bills. We've got relationship traumas. We've got all this other things going on. But what we're doing is Jesus is saying to us, hey, there's a deeper problem that you have. Those are just presenting issues. Jesus wants to go to the heart of the issue. He wants to show you that he is God, and he has the authority to do something far greater than that. See, this is the reaction of Jesus. Jesus is always he's most concerned with our greatest need. Write that thought down. That's powerful, right? And our greatest need is the forgiveness of sins. I know it's popular today to talk about social justice Jesus. Oh, this is our, our healer Jesus. This is our, our teacher Jesus. But, but our greatest need, listen, is alienation from God. This is why Jesus came to the house and he was preaching. He knows what our greatest need is. And the greatest healing that we need is to be reconciled and restored to God. And true restoration begins with the forgiveness of sins. This is the root of all our problems. This is why he addressed it so that we can have relationship with God restored and with each other. You see, listen, your, your greatest need today Whatever you think your greatest need is, it's secondary at best to having a right relationship with Christ. 
secondary at best. And it's not that Jesus is unconcerned for your issue. He's concerned. He knows that the right relationship, however, is what everything else hinges on. He's not unconcerned with your pain. He's not unconcerned with your trauma. He's not unconcerned with your struggle. But his highest aim and priority is that you, he wouldn't just have you on Sunday mornings. No, he wants everything about you. He wants your heart. That's why he came to heal your heart, the real poison that was in your heart, and that is sin. That's the one thing that hinders us from him. Let me show you this from the Matthew account of the same story. Jesus said to the paralytic son, watch this, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. It's like, really? Like I'm still paralyzed. Now think about this. If this man was crippled as a result of his lifestyle, forgiveness would be the thing that was gnawing at his heart. That's what he really needed. This man needed to know that he was forgiven from his past. Uh, this is the great need that all of us have. Some of us are still walking around paralyzed by the things in our past by previously committed sins. And in essence, they are paralyzing us spiritually, emotionally, and relationally. And we can't enjoy the fullness of life. We can't enjoy the love that God has for us because we're walking around with this burden. See, the, the, the reality is that, that, that when we hurt, the most important need we have is, is forgiveness. Let me show you this in, in, in Romans 4. This is the Apostle Paul quoting David. Here's what he said. Blessed, happy, so the most happiest people are those who's what? Say the next line with me transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him in other words the happiest person in the world is the person who knows he's forgiven and I suggest to you that although his friends were disappointed that day to hear these first words out of Jesus they were totally exactly what this person needed to hear Jesus is always concerned with our greatest need. One final reaction, the reaction of the Pharisees, and we're going to close. Now, he goes on and he says in verse 6 and 7, not, uh, oh, it's right here, it is on the screen. Uh, verse 6 and 7, listen to this. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can, foresee, who can forgive sins but God? Like, ding, 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 ding. You're getting it. Hello. Like, just work that out a little bit, and you'll kind of come to the conclusion that I want you to know. Like, Jesus is trying to get their attention and say, I am God. I do have the power to forgive sins. But they say, like, who talks like that? This guy's blaspheming. Who talks like that? Like, imagine if, if, if somebody, okay, if you two were in a fight right here, you guys were really going at it and just kind of banging back and forth, and I just came in there, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I forgive you. What? You're not even in on this. Like, what? No, no. And I wash away everything you guys have ever done. You think I'm crazy. Like, you're not God. Who do you think you are? You're not even the person that we wronged. Like, who can forgive? The, who, who talks like that? Who, who, who does that? that? That's what Jesus does here in this situation because he's trying to prove that only God can talk like that. And as soon as he does that, Jesus gets their attention. By the way, we're, we're short on time, so I don't have to, uh, time to unpack this, but, but uh, the reaction of the Pharisees is always one of opposition is always one of opposition. And I can just say, when, when there is opposition, it tr usually proves that there is an opportunity on the other side of opposition. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, hey, I'm staying here, and I'm going to preach the word. Not because it's really sunny here and awesome, and they have fine dining. No, it's because a door for the ministry has been opened here. You know how he knew the door for ministry was opened in that region? Because he experienced tremendous opposition there. Every time you face opposition, it is an opportunity that God uses to show his glory, to show that he is blessing you. When God blesses you, the enemy always brings opportunity. Uh, uh, opposition. So listen, when was the last time you gave God thanks for opposition? When was the last time you gave God thanks for your enemies? When was the last time you gave God thanks for that thorn, for that conflict? Thanks for that wilderness, for that problem, that loneliness, the conflict, the pain. That, that always proves the opportunity for God to do something amazing in your life. And it's interesting to me that those friends that brought the man to Jesus, they see the opportunity and it's the Religious leaders who are the ones in opposition. And I can speak to that because sometimes we as religious leaders are the ones who are like, well, God, you can't do that. 
That, that's not how it goes. You can't say that. Sorry. You, nope. That, that tradition. Tradition. Like, that's my favorite movie. Okay. But, like, that's, that's what they do. All right. Let's finish up. We're running out of time. Oh, my gosh. I'm getting. Okay. Watch this. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said, now, this is so savage of Jesus, right? Like, this is so cool. He's winning an imaginary argument with them, and they haven't even spoken. Isn't that great? Like, you can fool somebody, you can fool me, but you can't fool Jesus. He, like, he reads your thoughts, he knows your motivations, he knows your heart action on, on, on top of that. And he says, uh, uh, he knows their motives, so he says, why are you thinking these things? So he asked them this question, which is easier to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and get your mat and walk? It's a great question. Which is easier to say? Get up and walk, or your sins are forgiven? Which is easier? Yeah, the Pharisees had the same reaction like you. They were just kind of stunned, right? And, and here's the real answer. It, it depends, right? Because on one side, it's easier to say because your sins are forgiven. Why? Because nobody can verify that. There's no way you can say, you can say that and it may not be true. But to say, rise up and see a paralyzed man get up, that could be harder to do because in about five minutes, you're going to know if somebody has the juice to pull that off. Right? But, but only God can forgive sins. So, so, so that's infinitely harder. And so Jesus presents them this kind of conundrum, this problem, uh, which is easier to do, to forgive or to heal. And he just kind of resolves it by sticking them together. Here's what he says. Uh, but I want you to know that the Son of Man, so he's referencing here the, uh, Daniel's title of the coming Messiah. This should have been another sure dinger to them that, hey, this is the Messiah, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So only God has the authority, and Jesus says, I am God. So he says to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. See, the healing was intended to prove that Jesus is not blaspheming. He is God. He has the power to forgive sins. And Jesus, in front of everybody, gets up. It's no magic trick, no hocus pocus. No, Jesus tells this guy to get up, and he does. I mean, this is a real miracle that Jesus performs. I'm going to call the worship team forward. Um, now, imagine we're in that situation, okay? And imagine I'm the paralyzed guy. And now Jesus says, get up. And I get up and I just start walking. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm just going to make my way through everybody. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm walking. That was me. That, excuse me. Right? And he gets out into the courtyard and it's, and it's open. And he's like, oh, you guys are here too? Oh, the courtyard's full. Hey, by the way, there's a roof open there. That's how I got there. Maybe you want to go through that. You should use that. That's how I got my healing. Go, go see Jesus. Right? Go see Jesus. And he, like, and he goes home. And he tells his people, hey, they, they said this man, his name is Jesus, and he came, and he forgave my sins, and then he said, get up, and here I am walking. Is the worship team walking? Like, they might be paralyzed. Worship team, come on. Like, hello, worship. All right, we're running low on time. What's going on? All right, in all seriousness, watch what happens next. This amazed everyone. Of course it does. Like that word amazing, we, we leave church sometimes and we think, oh, church was amazing today. And we do this little golf clap, like how amazing. But that word that's used there in the original language, thank you guys. That word that's used in the original <laughs> language is like mind blown. <laughs> Perfect timing, mind blown. Look what they did. Praise God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Powerful, powerful. So listen, you're here today because somebody carried your mat. You may be here for the very first time today because somebody pointed you to Jesus and said, hey, you should go meet Jesus. You may be here today and you may be thinking, man, I have all these presenting issues. I have all these needs. I have all this stuff. And Jesus is saying, I am here. I want to show you that I am God. I'm going to address your issues. But before I address your issue, I want to address your real issue. You need forgiveness. You need healing. You need uh, uh, deliverance. I have not come to just uh, be an add-on to your life and make your life better. I have come to forgive you of your sins and make you right for eternity. That's what Jesus is saying. And you could leave here praising God, full of joy, full of praise, saying, man, I have never seen anything like this before. I've never experienced Jesus in this way.